our speaker. I'd like to introduce Lloyd Mustin, the Air and Space Engineer for 55 years, went to Indiana University, University of Cincinnati, Indiana University of Denver, and retired from Boeing in June 2011. Worked for GE, Martin, Lockheed, Northrop Space Labs, North American Rockwell, and Rockwell Boeing. Mr. Mustin is going to be talking this morning on the Apollo 13 disaster and aspects of it. Mr. Mustin. Thank you. Thank you. He's not going to talk about history of football game, so he's not here to <laughs> one Hoosier from one Hoosier to another. No. It's only been 50 years since we've been to the Rose Bowl, right? 50 years? Some people never forget. Take your time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. First of all, thank you for starting your meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I haven't experienced that in years. That is such a pleasure. That is great. Keep it up. That's good. Okay, first of all, um, I'm not sure how many, many of you know that I'm the one who found the oxygen tank that you have on display downstairs. I was working at Boeing and I got a call from the the Boeing surplus yard. They said, we have a couple of tanks here and we want to puncture so we can scrap them. And I had the tanks on shelf, so they, they called me. I went, sure. So I go down and I find two tanks in their blue shipping containers. And I said, good grief, don't touch them. Those are Apollo tanks. And we happen to have the, the data packs in those tanks. So we knew they were about, about 30 years old. And uh, being engineers, we want to check them out. Mm -hmm. They're, they're vacuum-jacketed, so we checked the vacuum. Perfect, after 30 years. We did a good job. <clears throat> and so we checked them electrically. Perfect. So these tanks were tanks that had been modified after the Apollo 13 incident. And we tried to figure out where they came from. All we could find out was that they, were, they came off the space shuttle contract. How they got there, I have no idea. But. So you guys got one, and then I think the other one went to Smithsonian. I wanted to buy them from Surplus, what I wanted to do, but they wouldn't let me. But anyway, let me, let me tell you a bit about where I'm coming from. As you mentioned, I, I've been in aerospace 55 years, started out GE on, on jet engines, and I went to Martin in Denver on Titan II missiles. Then went to Lockheed and Sunnyvale on, on satellites. Then I came down to, uh, to Northrop, Northrop Space Labs in, in Hawthorne for exactly 91 days. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a story behind that. Mm -hmm. I was driving back from lunch one day and I hear an outdoor speaker say something about contract cancellation. I don't know what that is. Someone in the office, Ranger Block thought like Moonliner had been terminated as of 4 o'clock that day. Two hundred of us were, were gone right away. Friday the 13th, before the holidays. So I did the usual, I went to, you know, to several companies, you know, we don't have anything. Went to North American Innovation and Alley, I'm sorry, we don't have anything. Well, I had a, had a friend who worked at GE back in Cincinnati with me, and he, he came out before I did. So he was a design manager at North American Downing. He said, listen, I've got a friend that owes me a favor, why don't you come on in? I had six interviews and two offers. One for ground support equipment, GSA, and one for, for testing operations. And I took, took testing operations, best choice to make. So it's not always what you know, sometimes it's who you know that helps. So I started in, in January 27th, 1964 <coughs> on Apollo. Loved it. It's great. And then in 1976, I transferred to Space Shuttle. Love that one too. You know, especially Space Shuttle, you couldn't buy that kind of experience because I got in on, the, on development, design, production, test, installation, and flight support, beginning to end. And I loved every minute. I had the, I had the fuel cells and the, the cryogenic storage tanks on, on, on the shuttle. And, uh, so, so today, though, we're going to talk about Apollo 13. Not, not so much about the mission, I'm, I'm sure you all know about that, but more about what caused the problem. And uh, 
in, a, in Apollo, I was in the tests and operations. I had all, all mechanical operations, the docking system, the crew systems, and I had to team and install all the parachutes. Now, the fuel cell and tank guys were in my, my group, so I knew what they were doing and I, about, about all of this. So, so first, let's... Uh, Okay, first let's just go over the Apollo milestones up to Apollo 13. So we started back, back in July of 1960, and then, then JFK made his, his famous announcement that before the end of this decade, America will land man on the moon and return them safely to Earth. I think that's probably the last time that the whole country was behind this kind of program. I don't think we're, I don't think we're gonna see that today, but. So then we go on one down and then in bold, in January 64, I, I started. My first job was weight and balance of, of water plate 15. I can't recall it. It took me a week to do it. But. And then as we, as, as we progress down, I was looking at this and seeing, we did pretty well. We, we got a lot about done in a short period of time. But again, we had to uh, in, in Downey, we had about 35,000 people working on it. And I think total was something like 300,000 people across the country, including all the, all the sub tier suppliers. A lot of people working on that one. Now, you've, you've seen the patch. Do you know the story behind it? Okay, essentially, it was, was Lowell's idea to use the the Greek god Apollo, driving his chariot across the sky and dragging the sun with it. So he he had designed his Gemini 7, Gemini 12, and Apollo 8 patches. So he gave this idea to this New York artist and came up with this three-horse design. And Lovell picked, picked the model, Ex Luna Saliente, meaning from the moon, knowledge. Sort of similar to the Naval Academy, where he went, which was from the sea knowledge. And aside from Paul Levin, this is the only one that did not include the names of the crew members. And this was the only flight that had a crew change. So I'm sure the rest of the crews didn't want to tempt fate by living by their names. Because this had a lot of stuff behind it. Okay, let's get right into it then. Okay, this is this is a cross section of the of the service module where the uh, tanks and fuel cells are. <coughs> tank two, of course, was right right here on, on this shelf, and tank one was behind it. The three three fuel cells up, up here, and the two hydrogen tanks down here. So this whole little panel was the one that got, got blown off during the, the mission. Here's a picture of the actual hydrogen tanks, and there's tank two right there. And you can see the, the, the structure of the, of the shelf it's on. Now here's a cross section of the, of the tank. It is, as I say, it's vacuum jacketed. This is the quantity, quantity gauge and drill right here. It's also the, the fill line for the tank. Goes down, comes out here. Up here is a, is a vent line. You can't really see it in this, in this picture. And we talked about the fans. There's a, there's a fan up here and a fan down here to, to stir the, the oxygen. We have, have the heater, which has two different coils on it. And this close-up cap here is, is also evacuated. There's a burst disc that would, would burst at 75 psi if the, if the vacuum got, if the, if the inner, inner pressure vessel leaked into the vacuum analyst, that, that disc would, would, would blow out. Of course, it's, this just shows up, but on we, we supply a fuel cell. Or we go to the, I'm sorry, 
this one line goes to both the fuel cell and the environmental control system, which provides the oxygen with crew. So really, this is the utility system for the for the uh, Apollo. And of course, the fuel cells also produce the water, so we we get water and power and oxygen. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. How often do they actually have to do the stirring of the oxygen in this tank? How often did they have? They were they were doing about about twice a shift. Mm -hmm. So at, at every four hours or so. At the beginning. Okay. So as it got more empty, they had to do it less often, or what? You didn't get much stratification below sixty percent. <laughs> So what was the concern if they did not stir the oxygen? It, it makes it more, more difficult for you to get a, an accurate quantity. Mm -hmm. were, could, were they afraid that it would settle in one spot in this in this tank and do something to the hardware? What was the reason for having to stir it? To get a good quantity of energy. To get bubbles. Okay. <clears throat> And if you were in it, and if, if you had a, um, a vehicle motion like a button like over change where you restart the engines, that would cause a normal. Yeah. It really isn't an issue, but, but they had it initially, yeah. Um, this just shows how the uh, the tanks were hooked up to the fuel cells, and then the fuel cells were attached to the two main buses. On a special, we had three three buses, but here we had two. And you could put the bus tie, <coughs> so you could, you could manipulate it quite a bit. But the, but the problem started in, in Downing. Where we, we put the tank together with the, with the shelf, and then we install the shelf into the service module. Now, this particular shelf <clears throat> was going to be, uh, or this this vehicle, the service module was for Apollo 10, and uh, we found that there was some back iron pump issues they wanted to modify. So rather than work on the tanks in a service module, they took the shelf out and fixed it with that kind of pumps. And then they just put another shelf into Apollo 10. So the shelf they took out was the one that we're going to put in Apollo 13. That's the one we're going to be talking about. This is a piece of GSA they used to take the shelf out. It would attach here in front and then come under here and support. So they had a lot of little bolts to take out. Well, they just one bolt back at the apex of the, of the, the shelf. <clears throat> so as they're lifting this up, the, the front comes up approximately two inches. Mm -hmm. Some estimations maybe as high as six inches. And this, this GSC broke. Shelf drops down with a sudden thump. Uh, and I know everybody was, was worried about that out there. This is in, their, in the uh, cleaning room at Valley. And at the time, the service module was, was stacked and the client module was on top. So they, they did get the, get the shelf out and they did uh, uh, proof testing. They checked the, they checked the circuits, all the, all the thermostats, the heaters, switches, everything shut out okay. So they said, okay, we'll just go ahead and use this. So they put this in Apollo 13 service module mm -hmm. and went through uh, integrated test. Of course, we did, we did not do any cryogenic testing in Delhi because of the safety issues, but everything else and checked out fine. So, okay, let's, let's ship it to the Cape, which they did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Okay, so when 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 you guys lifted that, did you did, and when the bolt was attached, was there any kind of NDI done to see if there was any kind of stress done? Uh, 
You know, I don't recall. I can't, uh, they, I'm sure they did as much as they could because that's a that's a real concern when you, something like that happens. I know a lot of times we've had issues where they you had two overhead cranes. You're, you're picking up something and then you move it. Sometimes they make a mistake and now bang the other crane. So whatever was hanging on, they it really you know check it out in, in detail. Yeah. It's a, did a thorough, thorough job. Everything was okay, as far as I could tell. Uh, now these these tanks were made by by Beach Aircraft in Boulder, and uh, before Apollo 13, there were already been 14 tanks that successfully flew. So what was different about this tank on, on Apollo 13? <sighs> Nothing we know of yet. So we, we took it down to uh, to the Cape and, and stacked it up. And then they, uh, they stacked it onto the center uh, five, moved it up to pad 39A, and they do what they call a CDDT, a count down demonstration test. But they go through everything exactly as launch, right down to the moment before you press the button to go, which includes loading with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which went well. They were, they were able to load it, and uh, so then, normally partway through the countdown test, they lower the tank quantity down to about. 50%. So they did that. And they do it by introducing gaseous oxygen at about 80 psi in, into the event line. And, and that actually, if you introduce it up, up here, then it pushes blocks up through its capacitance through and out. And um, Tank one did okay, but tank two did not. It only went down to 92%. So they took what they called a, an IDR, interim, interim discrepancy report. And they were suspecting that there was some issue with a, a GSE filter at that time. But after many round the world discussions with NASA, KSC, JSC, Beach, and Rockwell, we decided to resume detanking a few days later. And by that time, tank two had depleted on down to 83% and was venting through its, its fill line. So further discussions, they considered the problem might be due to a problem with the fill line here. And the fill line is a little incremental tube right there. On either end of the tube are, are Teflon sleeves that connect the outside here with, with the quantity probe. And the thought at that time was it could have been that downing when we dropped it, but that sleeve got misplaced so that the flow path was not down here and then out to vent. It was in here and right away out to vent. So you couldn't get, you, you couldn't get all, the, all the quantity out. But they decided to, to continue. So the good, so they decided to proceed with a normal detanking procedure for both tanks by pressurizing through the vent line and opening the fill line. Well, again, tank one worked, just like it should. Tank two didn't. So on tank two, we decided we're gonna, we're gonna boil off. We're gonna try to boil the oxygen out of there. Do it by using tank heaters. So we just, we turn the heaters on 
And to speed up the process, the heaters were energized by the ground power supply of 65 volts DC. Uh, the, the command module uses 28 volts DC. Hmm. Okay, so then the, about an hour and a half later, they turned on the fans also to get a little more heat, a little more action. And after six hours, the chlorinate had only gone down to 35%. So now I'm going to try pulse purging. So with the heaters and fans on, the tank is pressurized to 300 psi, held for a few minutes, and then opened up and vented to, to the fuel line. So about five pulse purge cycles, and we got it, we got it empty finally. So again, more around the world discussions. What are we going to do? Well, I said we want to. We want to prove that we can safely load the tank. So we loaded the tanks again. And again, it was able to be loaded, and it didn't have any problems. So they loaded them to twenty percent this time. And again, it required pulse purging with the heaters on to get it back out. But everyone concurred that we can safely load the tank. And since we don't, we don't offload during the mission, it should, should be okay. As we say, people are probably be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they, they, they didn't realize that major damage had been done to the tank during the eight hours that the heaters and, and fans were on. <coughs> I mean, I mean, we, I wasn't part of it, but I know that we took extreme care to make sure it was okay. But they just missed this one thing. So the tanks were successfully loaded. And Apollo 13 was launched on April 11, 1970. The only, the only significant anomaly was a premature shutdown of the, of the center engine of the S2 stage. So as a result, the remaining four engines burned 34 seconds longer, and the S4B third stage burned a few seconds longer. Just demonstrating the versatility of the system. Question. Hmm. Uh, if you had removed the tank, what would, what timeline would that have uh, affected the mission? If it had moved it at, at, at the pad, it, it would have been quite a So would, would, would they scrub it or this? They would have had to scrub it for a while. Because <laughs> I, I don't think we would have taken it out in the <laughs> service module. I think you have to take the shelf out right. and then take it out. So it would be a, a major issue. Comes back off the pad, I assume. What? It comes back off the pad. They, they, they move the, the whole rocket back, right? Mm -hmm. They take it back. Oh yeah. Yes. They may not have had to. That's not the kind of thing you do out on the on the launch pad. Right. Not the amount of structures for removing. But I'm sure that question came up, size. right? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. when you're doing evaluation, oh, yeah. when you said they missed it, somebody probably raised their hand and said, "Wait a minute, what if it?" What if we go south with it, right? Mm -hmm. Which it obviously did. Mm -hmm. Every, all those things are taken into, into right. account, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And funding was getting tighter, and the number of moon missions was getting tighter. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you if you delay naming one or two moon missions a day. Sounds like the space shuttle issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But look at this, though. Everything worked fine except the detanking. They don't detank in space. So there was, you know, there was yeah. a, lot, a lot of talk about it. it. It's, easy, it's easy to look at it in hindsight. Yeah, sure. No, I'm, you got a bad tank. You know, yeah. in hindsight, you got a bad tank. You got a bad tank. It was a, it was a, a lot of head scratching after trying to find out what was different about this tank. Because 14 other tanks had. The flow on and done well. And tank one was good, no, no problem with it. Right. 
But again, it seems a revolution. This type of definition would not occur. We're not quite interested, but the problem is there. I've got a question. You said you had to use external 65 volts from ground source to purge the tank to help the heater to purge the tank. How did they anticipate they were going to do that in space when there was only a 28 volt source? <coughs> they weren't. They didn't want, they didn't think they would be purging the tank? The, well, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be using 65 volts in space. Well, they, but they, they needed it on the ground. And they wouldn't be pulse purging the tank in space. They 65 get, volts. No, okay. The, the, uh, the, the thermostat here it was originally designed for 28 volts. In 1965, it was upgraded to 65 volts because that's what the Cape used in the ground power supply. This tank's thermostat was not the latest one. Hmm. So you have an over voltage condition there. Designed for 28 and running 65. <coughs> Not good. Not good. I, I don't know the history as to why they missed that. They missed the extra bolt. I'm surprised that you <laughs> assembly engineers <laughs> yeah. do the sequence of assembly and disassembly <clears throat> missed a bolt. You know, that's really a major cool plot there. You know, you, Count six bolts, but you've only got them removing five. You know that type of thing. Some major screw up there. Tyler is, is easy standing back and saying that, but if you're there, absolutely. It yes, happens. we've done a lot of stupid it things. You know, <laughs> that's certainly not the most stupid thing we ever no. did. But uh, and sometimes you learn to be more more detailed in your procedure. You have eight bolt. And you check them off. Mm -hmm. I'll bet they did next time. But, uh, well, you learn by your mistakes. So, fortunately, I didn't, I didn't write the procedure for that. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, where are we now? Okay, so the mission was, was quite, quite routine up to the point where, where um, Seymour Liebergott, who's the ECOM. ECOM is the system operations engineer who, who monitors the electrical, environmental, and some other technological systems. So ECOM got a red master alarm alert for low pressure in a hydrogen tank. So he was he was working for, for that quite a, quite a while. No, 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 no issue, but just, just working with it. So it was almost routine for him. But the problem was, this alarm preempted the circuits of the warning system such that a problem with the oxygen tank would not turn on the warning light. I guess that was just part of the circuitry. Yeah. So ECOM requested the flight director, Gene Kraus, to ask the astronauts to stir the hydrogen tanks and while they're at it, go ahead and do the, the oxygen tanks. Since he'd been having trouble, he actually been having trouble getting a, a good reading of the oxygen tanks earlier. So at, at mission elapsed time of 55 hours and 53 minutes after the fans were turned on, all, all telemetry readings stopped and dropped out at about 1 .8, for 1.88 seconds. And then the caution and warning system one indicated low voltage on main bus B. So I'm sure it was an exciting time for those guys with those, those lights up there. The crew heard a big, big bang and felt the vibrations. And that's the point where the swagger said, Houston, we've had a problem here. And shortly thereafter, the command module was essentially dead with just the three Reentry batteries in the, in the command module left, providing 120 amp hours. And you had to have those for the, for the critical reentry. Sure. Now let's look back at what happened when the fans turned on to stir the oxygen. 
And we're back to pad. We did a CDDT test. They turned the heaters on. And powered them up with 65 volts for eight hours. Thermostat is only rated for 12 newton volts. The thermostat opens up when the temperature reaches 80 degrees. Well, by turning the heaters on, it got warmer in there. And so the thermostat tried to open. When it did, it got a spark and welded it closed. So it, it never shut the heaters off. Mm. Just one problem after another. Now, why didn't they notice it? Well, because they were expecting this to work. It was different in Delta because we shut the heaters off. So they weren't monitoring the heater current. They were all concerned about the other issue. So, so this eight hours, we later determined raised tank temperature, heater temperature, up to a thousand degrees. Jeez. I'm surprised the tank didn't blow up before. Earlier. We build them good, that's all. <laughs> and uh, well, one more interesting fact I forgot to give you was that, that uh, after they separated from the S4, S4B stage, they sent it down towards the moon, towards the ocean of storms to imp impact there because Apollo uh, 12 had left a seismometer there and they wanted to see what that did. So they had data they had for, for four hours after the impact. So that's using their meaning got. That's good. Okay. So, um, So at the point now where the thermostat did not shut off the heaters, heaters continued to work the temperature went up to 1,000 degrees. And the heater wires insulated with Teflon. And these two sleeves up here are, are Teflon. And there's other Teflon in there. The Teflon is combustible at 1,000 degrees. It left bare wires around the around the fan. Now, what's what's kind of kind of funny is up to this point of 55 hours, they had already stirred the tank two times. Nothing happened. But when they did it this time, they got, got a short spark, ignited the Teflon. And in, in measuring the, the pressure rise, they determined it wasn't the tank exploding, it was a, a, a pressure rise. And they, and they um, determined that the, the progress of the flame along a, a Teflon wire matched the time it took for the pressure to increase enough to blow it out. Now, the, the, uh, the panel on, on sector four on the, on the service module was blowing out. And it takes, takes 25 psi uniformly across the, the surface for it to blow out. It's a good thing it did because it only takes 10 psi difference between the command module, each year, and the service module to actually separate. Yeah. If I would have separated, they'd have never made it back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They weren't really using much on the, off the service module anyway. I mean, they had shut down everything there in the service module, right? They were only living off of the limb power and whatever they used in the command module. But you, had, but you had to use the service module engine to make some orbital changes. But they didn't have the capability. They were using the the lunar excursion module is the same engine for their uh, return trajectory around the moon right. for about five minute burns. Mm -hmm. 
It was kind of tough on that engine. That was a long burn. Yeah. Well, yeah. So let's see, where are we now? Out in space. Out in space. Yes. Uh, I'm sure you all know how they got back. I didn't really go into that that detail, but I mean, it was it was hairy. Yeah, it really was. They had to make some some uh, some sightings with the crewman optical alignment site to get the proper navigation and outside they had all these these particles that came from the service module panel going out. It was hard for them to, to pick a star so they had to use the the site on the lunar module. They transferred the data from the command module to the lunar module. And, um, the Apollo 13 movie showed people, you know, rushing around. And it wasn't that way. People were not that way. They were very calm. These, these guys down at Mission Control are well trained. They go through all kinds of scenarios of issues. And you don't see them running around with their heads off. They've been there with calm. And Gene, Dean Kranz was a. <laughs> Actually, we, we call him the Nazi. Yes. <laughs> he was a, he was tough. It was a kind word, but he yeah. was a good guy. He was, yeah. he was a good guy. He was the right guy for this this job. He kept every, everything going well. But they would never have practiced for this scenario. Pardon me. They would never have practiced for this scenario, would they? No. I when they you know they they practice all kinds of different scenarios. Would they have practiced this particular type of stuff? I don't think so. I don't think so. They didn't need to know whether they were going to go around the moon or back up and make a U turn before they got to the moon. This scenario was just kind of everything in real time. But not only did they have all those people at NASA working on this, they had all the support from all the <coughs> contractors oh, yes. that were, had inputs for Everybody was working on I spent a lot of hours on this. On this discovery, yeah, all of us did. Ninety some hours, as a matter of fact. So here's here's a picture of the tube. This is the this is the top of the tank up here, and this is a, a Teflon's head. This is the Teflon stove, and this is the Econel tube between. Somehow the drop is the shelf that causes us to get displaced. So instead of going through this all the way down the capacitance probe to the bottom of the tank, it went out here and to the vent and back out. So you weren't able to tank that way. Anybody a question? No? Okay. So this this really was the cause. Well, a lot of things with the cross there. This is my favorite picture of the Saturday Fall Night picture. I used to get down, get down to the Cape a few weeks before the next launch. It was to, to check out the docking system. So, so one time I was there and we, we took a break about, about four in the morning. So let's, let's go off of the pad. So we went out there, we went to we wanted to go up, up top. Well, the, the guard at the, at the guard shack must have been Barney Fife. <laughs> he's got this, he's walking around like this, and he says, you down the guys aren't going to get up there. I'm in charge of the pad tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I had to bite my tongue on that one. So we made a, a call, and, and we, we got up. So we got up all the way up to the, there. About 364 feet or whatever it is. And when it's at the pad, there's another other tire with a the crane at the top. So that, that crane started to move. And that tower goes like this. And you're hanging off. It's a long way up there. Yeah. Is that the moon in that picture? That's the moon. Yes. From the, that's from the west side of 39A. What's that? That's from the west side. If that was a sun up, that's from the west side of the, of the pad. 
That's a beautiful picture. Okay, now let's let's go back over again. The chain of events. We had the the bolt was not removed during the shelf removal. It was a mix-up. Lifting GSC was overstressed and broke, causing the shelf to drop at least two inches. Some think as many as, as six. So they did we did lot, lots of analysis on the acceleration and, and the loads and so forth. And that was the time when this tank fill tube was dislodged. And then the thermal switch failed to open to 80 to shut the heaters off de during dechanting. It's also interesting that, that, the, that the pressure sensor that would have read at 80 degrees only read to 85 degrees. It, it would not indicate anything higher, which is kind of strange. <clears throat> and of course, they didn't, they didn't monitor the heater currents during the eight hours that it was on. And later on, they, they proved that would have been a thousand degrees. And the thermal switch was the obsolete configuration, it wasn't rated 65 volts, and welded closed. And of course, the, the Teflon and the aluminum would burn at high temperature and pure oxygen. So did it explode or just depressurize? They decided it was not an explosion, it was more like a rupture due to high, high pressure. Because of the, of the, the pressure wise time was something like 16 seconds, so it was not an explosion. You know, once the liquid oxygen and oxygen, pure oxygen are released, is it a hazard to the, uh, the vehicle? I mean, because of the enriched environment, would, it, would something possibly combust on their own without heat? Well, I'll throw some paper, I think it could combust almost over anything. You don't understand what you... No, I just think yeah. the vehicle is in an atmosphere of enriched oxygen. Is that a, a hazard to the vehicle for something like this? This is a service module, so it's not in, in the command module, so there will not be. So, so the, the tank is in a vacuum. So. And it also vented. Since the panels. Sorry, what not that It was not set to. Oh, no, but I, no, I meant. But could, could not that, where it was, ignite if there's something else that is flammable in a pure oxygen atmosphere. But you don't have any temperature. It's no oh, yeah, yeah, temperature. Okay. I don't think so. The only thing that would would be hydrazine. And, and it contained, the, the SRS contained hydrogen, hydrazine engine, but that's in a tank and wouldn't be exposed. Or any hypergolic fuels would combust. Yeah. You know, um, years later, we stopped using Teflon in spacecraft because of the temperature problems as well as in space, Teflon sublimates, it dissolves. It's no longer a good bearing as you'd think it would be on, as we see it here on Earth with an atmosphere. Teflon really is not very friendly in, in space at all. It's not too good with the liquid nitrogen temp liquid That's right. nitrogen temperatures either. You don't want to cook with it in your pans in, in your kitchen, as a matter of fact. It's anyway, so look, look at some of the modifications that we made after this, this issue. We added a third tank set for a 282 tank, which had already been planned for Apollo 15 J series to extend the mission time. A valve was added to the third oxygen tank to be isolated from the full cells and from the other two tanks in an emergency to feed the command module and run the control systems. We also added a 135 pound battery rated at 415 amp hours, which was identical to the limb batteries. That was added to the service module. They took, they took the fans out. They took the thermal, thermal switches out. <coughs> they changed the quantity gauging probe from aluminum to stainless steel. And the heating units were changed since they had three separate elements that they could interchange and, and use individually. 
and all wiring associated with fans was insulated with magnesium oxide and sheathed with stainless steel. Shell tank says it the same thing. Obviously, you saw the issue with the carbon dioxide issue in the land going back. Did they modify that with regard to the, the venting and going from the land back into the command module? Yeah. That was, that was cool. I don't know. Like the command module in the limb. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to remember what the. All I remember is they had the box. Okay. They they built their scrubbers. Right. The scrubbers. Yeah. Right. But, there's there's yeah. the box you're talking about there where they right. They were able to adapt the rectangular command module box to the, to the round. Yeah. Lamb. And did they adapt that for the next? I session? don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That was very interesting. Just getting more done. Yeah. I mean, that That's was very right. suspenseful part, part of the whole movie. That was very suspenseful right there. Yeah. Yeah. How are you going to get that done? Because you see, oh, I mean, the, the level is going down, right? Yeah. They're going to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. So, why did you have to stir the tanks? Oh, well, initially, the thought was that we need to stir the tanks so we can get a good, good chronic reading. <laughs> and when we do the sun stratification because of zero G or any, any movement of the, of the vehicle, uh, but on, on Apollo that only occurred above 60% quantity in the tanks. So really, as it turns out, what is an issue? If you understand it, it's not an issue. So we don't we don't have any fans on the on, on space shuttle. We just can't can work with it. Um, so they used the a. Uh, a suit hose here and good old duct tape. We can do anything with duct tape. Absolutely. <laughs> Doesn't matter what color it is. No, you don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I would say duct tape and bail on can fix anything, but he didn't have a baby more. So. so they were able to germ rig this so that they could use the lamb, I mean, the, the command module CO2 absorbers in the lamb. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or vice versa, I can't recall which it was now. So, I want you to know that I, I really was a rocket engineer back in 1967. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Hair tie, wearing your glasses, white shirt. Full time. Uh, yeah. Pocket protector. Pocket protector. Yeah. Yeah. I, like the, like I like the color of your hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is John Young. This is Tom, Tom Stafford. Uh, this, this was in Downey. In our uh, what we called our DER room, the uh, design, uh, it was like a, like a mop up in there. Yeah. So we had, had the crew out and we were putting them into the, this, this mock up command module. And we had, we had stowed all the crew equipment. And I, I wrote the procedure and I would be, be out outside, headset on, and I would tell them what to do. You know, go to L3, take your suit out, put it over here, hook up this and all that. So we would we would record any discrepancies, and <coughs> we did a, a lot of those. Um, now, on, on the actual vehicle, we, we called it CEIT, Core Equipment Interface Test. And don't forget, engineers are very, very funny. We, we, we named the procedure 3366, C squared. Fit and function. Yes. Understand. Two threes, yes. two sixes. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and when we, when we did it in, in the actual vehicle, uh, we had them come out in inner suits with their portable oxygen ventilators. At, at Downey, we had uh, some, some crew crew quarters there where they had their, their, uh, their medical facilities there. Their couches and lay in to get their suits on, and so we had them walk out and we ingress into the command module. We had a safety crew, and it was a big, big show. Sure. Took all day, and uh, I'll tell you one, one, one story. So we had had Conrad Gordon and B, which always sounds like a a lawyer group <laughs> or a comedy team, but they they were funny. So they were there, and um, they were in the command module. I was out outside telling 
what to do. And all of a sudden, they, they started doing things on their own. I said, wait, 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 stop, Ken. This is, this is you know, planned out, right? Carefully. Well, Albane said, hold it. So we walked off together and we're, we're, we're talking. I was a little more aggressive in those days. And I said, we can't do this. We could, you know, this is planned out. He says, listen, I'm going to fly this. And I want to check everything out the way I want to check. Said, okay. Okay. So we go back and, and, and continue. So after the test, we would always join them in their crew quarters. You know, they had a, had a, um, a kitchen out there and, you know, beds and showers and so forth. So I, I had just been a few months ago to a, a seminar called Basic Youth Conflicts. Bill, Bill Gother, I'm not sure you know. Heard of that? Anyway, one of the, one of the principles I used with Al. I said, Al, I was wrong to get after you out there. Will you forgive me? He melted. Nobody ever said that to him. We were friends from then on. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, let's see what's up. Here, okay, here we are. The actual command module up in the stack. That's, I think that's Vance Brand. And there I am back there. I'll tell you what, I enjoyed those days. Those were good times. Mm -hmm. um, on, on Apollo, I didn't work with all the astronauts, but not on, not on shuttle. But uh, that's it. I'm a retired test director, uh, so I know that EPs, I know how you can become a Nazi, but uh, the EPs, I think, demonstrated how they were able to be calm cool and collected at the end because you do it to a point like Sully did, it becomes natural to be calm and know over all this stuff. But what I was curious about is because there were a couple of areas where you weren't set up to monitor or the logic was not such that you could get that data, could did they change anything in data reporting and did they change did they add anything new to the Apollo EP procedures for subsequent flights? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I know, I'm just trying to think what they could add. I don't know that. <clears throat> there was a problem. I don't know much much data. anything during the. We had 500 switches, dials, indicators inside that command module. There was such a limitation as to how much information could be relayed to the ground, just being with the law. Just not capable of it at that time, let alone the telemetry required to gather all this information. I don't think there was anything they would have added to the orbiter. Yeah, it, yeah, the yeah orbiter. it would have been so difficult so, to do. Uh, command module. But um, I'm sure during the, the ground operations, they would probably have monitored the heater current. Yes, sir. Why would you provide higher voltage from the ground of the vehicle than the vehicle normally operates on? Well, a problem to increase the, the shorten the time to detank it. I don't know. Very I don't have any other reason why. But, uh, <clears throat> seems seems uh, it's it's interesting reading all of the, all these reports. I got some conflicting data on all that, so I'm, I'm, I may not have the total picture, but that that's what I got. It was a it was. Upgraded to 65 because that's what the cape used. Why they did it, I don't know. Yes, sir. I'm going back to the movie. And one of the astronauts what, was declared to have the measles or mumps. Mm -hmm. And then he, as part of the movie, goes into the line to try to find some additional perk. Wind it down, right? To mm -hmm. a certain average. Uh, did you deal with that subject at all? And, and, and the uniqueness of his ability to. You know, still operate the command or operate the vessel. Uh, I mean, the line with with uh, just a limited amount of apps. I mean, did that come in to play at all? Well, he was yeah. he was very aware of the of the whole 
I think conviction. He was probably one of the best guys to do that. So work out well. Right. He was, I, I think the issue uh, was. I think the issue was um, powering up the command module again. Right. right. With, <laughs> with, with after it had been frozen and with only three batteries, re, re-entry batteries. Right. How would they? How could they power it up so that they wouldn't a get shorts and b you know? It, it was, was very average. close. Yeah. I mean, they had to discount a little bit of current. Yeah. Yeah, and right. still have enough to yeah. to um, operate the shoots. No. But the fact that you had that astronaut, you know, offline, and they could bring him, put him back in the in the, in the command module, and sit there and do it over and, and over and, and over. And by the way, and by the way, he never got the measles. He did. No, he didn't. No, he probably he probably was immune. And, and in today's day and age, they would have done lab studies and shown that he was immune. He would have let him get up. Yeah. One more bit of trivia mm-hmm. was is it Al Colin Shepard, you know, was up in her and so forth, and he, he got Meniere's disease before he got up on, on Gemini. And so he was out for all those those years and he became head of the astronaut office and um, then I think it was Tom Tom Stalker told him about a, a surgeon out here in LA that was able to, to do that emergency surgery on his ears mm-hmm. and it worked mm-hmm. so he got back into the lineup okay. he was going to be the one on Apollo 13. Mm-hmm. Dick, Dick Slayton who had the the um, national operations had chosen him and his crew to go on Apollo 13. Well George Mueller the head of manned space flight with the NASA said no he hasn't he hasn't been in the, in the loop long enough, and, and he kept saying, yeah, he's, he's good, but he was dropped. So he was on what? 14. 14. 14. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, which is, I was going to ask a question about that, since you were doing, just a side issue, you were doing docking, and on Apollo 14, um, they had trouble docking with the land. Do you know what that was about? I think it was, a, it, it was the latches on the end of the probe. Mm. Got Dinged? I something. forget exactly the problem now. The, the way they were coming, came in was to, to force it, basically. I mean, they put, they used their thruster to lock it, yeah. do a lot of hard, yes. hard, hard dock. Mm. Which reminds me of another, another story. One, one, right. one more. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dick, Dick Gordon came out to, to Downey. Mm-hmm. We were doing a docking test on, on the command module. We had a, had a simulated a docking wing from the land. So he was in the, in the command module tunnel about, about latch height. And, uh, and I was telling him what to do. And I said, oh, by the way, uh, don't actuate the latch without the ring here because it might cause internal damage. Each, each latch pulled down with 3,500 pounds force, a lot, lot of force, a small latch. I can, I can see him now. He got that impish look at his face, and he goes, and he actuated one of them. And he said, listen, I'm going to fly this, and I want to know what would happen if that occurred. Well, nothing happened, but I can still see that look in his face. And then later on, I said, uh, Dick, what was the what was the highlight of your trip? He said, looking up and seeing three parachutes. Mm-hmm. Well, he was pretty serious about that. Yes. yes. Well, thank you, Lloyd. I really appreciate your talk and information. Thank you. Uh,